So this is going to be a pretty interactive talk. I uh, hope you guys have um, had a cup of coffee. You can help us out by um, thinking up some of the answers for us. Uh, so uh, we are the Incorruptibles, and uh, my name is Anna. Hi, Liz. Liz. Uh, Hi, Liz. Hi, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, you know, we, the group is so small. Maybe we can just kind of go around and, and say, you are, and like one little sentence about why you're here to left more. I'm Dave. I'm basically trying to find my way and find, find different groups to get involved with. So. Great. Uh, Joe, you know, I was a Bernie Sanders delegate for New Jersey in, um, uh, last year. I'm Russ. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is going to be. I'm doing review as the third. Beatrice, um, I'm from New Rochelle. I'm a member of the Democratic Committee there and a district leader. Uh, and I'm also involved with uh, several other organizations like Indivisible Westchester and uh, New York Progressive Action Network. And I'm here to see how this particular organization uh, fits in with the others that are out there. I'm um, in uh, high school. Uh, I uh, joined DSA a couple of years, you know, several years ago, and uh, I just wanted to see uh, how you plan to uh, eliminate corruption in this time when there is so much corruption, and uh, that's all we have as a future. Great. Um, and my name is Bill. I am also the videographer. Uh, is there anyone who doesn't want to be on camera in case you ask a question? Okay. And um, I am a K. I was previously known as Bernie Claus. <laughs> Put on this great big Santa costume, had a giant sign, Bernie Sanders, and was giving away buttons. So he would come to Worcester in the middle of the winter, everybody's freezing outside, and I would go up the line as Bernie Claus, give out <laughs> buttons, and lead them in Bernie carols. Oh. That was your <laughs> Bernie, the Democratic Socialist. <laughs> so. In Worcester, Mass. Worcester, Mass, yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, we've, we met each other in Somerville about four years ago, and we've been friends ever since. Well, thank you all for coming here, um, and all the other things you could have been doing this morning. Um, so I put Spider-Man up here because my, I have a two-year-old, and he's like obsessed with Spider-Man. So um, when I was showing him my slides, he said there wasn't enough Spider-Man in my slides, so here he is. <laughs> Yay! Um, and uh, our first question for you is, why did Bernie's campaign spread like wildfire? This is a guy who was, you know, had maybe 3% of the polls, um, and a ton of people never heard of him. Uh, and he ended up with approximately, according to Gallup polls, 50% um, of Democrats fav you know, favoring him, um, and uh, tons of independents and even Republicans and became very popular. So why? How did, like that? That's kind of an unheard of phenomenon for that to happen. So why did that happen? Brett, you guys. I think one example. Uh, is, and I'm not saying she's the best candidate on the planet, but uh, if you saw the Paula Jean uh, Swergen clip, the town hall where she's pouring her heart out and talking about how much pain she's in, Bernie spoke from the heart, and people can, people can see that, they can feel that, and they have a pretty good BS detector. So um, the other thing is he's been talking for, what, 40 years? So I think that it just was lightning in a bottle that has been sitting there for 40 years yeah. and they know that he is authentic and they know he's real and if they didn't you can go back to 40 years worth of footage and say he's saying the same thing that he's been saying for 40 years. So it sounds like honesty and consistency. And consistency. It's not a flip-flop. Not a flip-flop. Yeah, yeah, if you go on YouTube, uh, agree with Dave, if you go on YouTube and uh, Look at something, uh, a speech of Bernie's when he was a congressman, even the mayor of, um, of Burlington, Vermont. Uh, same speech practically as today. Uh, a little less gray hair, but um, <coughs> same, the same thoughts and words. You know, especially, uh, 20, there was uh, something online for 22 years ago. 
Rick, who was talking about marriage equality mm -hmm. uh, and his support for it even before the civil union was passed in Vermont, which you know, talked about the radical, yeah. consistent point of view. Yeah, so again, with like consistency. Yeah. We're just kind of talking about why. And we've already introduced ourselves. I don't know if you wanted to say Oh, I'm Jean Boucher. I'm a sociologist at Stony Brook. And I work in technology society, and I feel like I should get into politics, but I'm just too chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Bernie, you know, he had this great frame of We're just going to tell the truth. Yeah. I don't know that he did or not. Is another question, but it sure sounded like he was good. Other reasons why? Yeah. Every other generation is uh, capable of doing something radical, and uh, this is a, a time for that, and uh, he came into that time. Wow, so, so this is great, because this is like a sociopolitical uh, history of, you know, looking at history and how politics and movements function. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. But yeah, he rode a wave, right? He rode the Wall Street wave and, you know, the whole <coughs> idea of the 1%, like that is now becoming a thing that you think about. Um, so yeah, absolutely, I think. Um, so we've got honesty and, and consistency and timing that, he, that we're now at a place where we can hear what he has to say, which he's been saying for 40 years. It's also humility. He said forever, it's not about him, it's about the movement. It's about the policies. And that is one of the most refreshing things that anybody, you know, that anybody can hear. Yeah. I'm talking to you, I'm talking about you. That's right. It's trying to plug into what, you know, what you're, you know, Trump did the, did the same thing in a different way, but so did Obama. Yes, he yeah. did. Yeah. Open change. But and that's part of the problem too. That once you hear it once, then twice. Yeah. Like wait a minute. Yeah. But that goes well, to, that goes back to consistency. Yeah, that's right. But I think because he had this, um, because people thought of him as being authentic and honest, that when he said something like that, it, it had a meaning for people. So we've done this talk other places, and the people talk about how he had a lot of experience in running campaigns. Right. Um, and if you read his book, Outsider in the House, um, man, like the Democrats and Republicans threw everything they could at him multiple times. So this is a guy who's been through the ringer over and over and over. Um, so he has a lot of experience running campaigns uh, personally and his team. Um, what are some of the other things that people have said about, oh, we haven't heard from Beatrice and oh. Well, he attracted so many young people. He got almost all the young people, the big majority on his side. And I was at the, uh, his rally in New York at Washington Square. It was amazing. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> said they uh, made such a restricted thing for people to vote. Uh, yeah, in New York. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I think you have to be registered as a Democrat like in 1961 or something. Or, or that maybe at the point uh, that it was very uh, restricted. Yeah. Just so for your info, uh, New York Progressive Action Network um, is working and lobbying to get uh, those uh, New York election election laws changed. Great. So is. Um, so as to allow for earlier times for uh, earlier times for registration, well, easy make things right. easier to register. Uh, what's on it there? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. good that that's changing. That's great. Do you yeah. have any ideas? Managed to lobby out. <laughs> we successfully lobbied uh, state senator in my district uh, to co-sponsor on the state senate level. We got uh, the state assembly people, most of the state. Center people on board Good. for those issues. That's great. Um, do you have any thoughts, or, or, or I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. We've kind of all, if we're a small group, we introduced ourselves and kind of why we're in the platform. Brian Graham from uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Support, we're support of the work on the left and the government Okay. Um, and do you have thoughts on why Bernie's campaign is in the I've had my coffee. I totally understand that. Yeah, totally.
Um, so another thing that people have mentioned, oh, please. Well, the one thing we haven't mentioned, of course, is we share his values. I mean, that's what I cared about. Yeah. I want universal health care. I want to eliminate racism. I want to eliminate wars. I want the rich people to pay with their taxes. I want corporations to be corporations and not people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about issues. Yeah. Yep. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Black women people like to talk about issues. Absolutely. And tying in with that is the only real candidate that I have ever seen to stand on a picket line not during an election. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. During an election and not during an election. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, how many other, uh, bef so he was elected in 1981 as the mayor of Burlington, Vermont, but before that, how many elections did he campaign? He, he was in several elections that he lost. <coughs> That's right. Before he won uh, the mayor. Do you know which one, what they were? Um, I don't know. Anybody? I think he ran for governor and like senator in Vermont. You're right, bing, bing, bing. He ran for senator twice, and he ran for governor, and he never got more than 5%, right? Um, so, so like, to us, that really says something, and we'll talk about that later. But, but like, this is part of why we're focusing on local politics, this idea that you know, without local politics in 1981, Bernie Sanders would never have existed. If people had not fought really hard to get him elected, we wouldn't have a Bernie Sanders. That was because, so it was because of him I decided I wanted to do more than just volunteer on campaigns and demonstrate. And uh, I finally managed to get through to New Rochelle. I joined their local Democrat Party. And they were looking for a particular vacancy district leader. And so by default, I became yeah. one. And I think that's really yes. important because that means that our politicians really can inspire us yeah. to take part in our democracy. And this is um, a little bit about what it's about for me because I'm very, I'm a little bit like you. I'm very new to all of this. Um, I kind of woke up and said, oh my gosh, I haven't been working for my democracy. This is my country. I live here. I need to do something. Um, so if we have politicians like that that can inspire people to really make change, then we're on our way to a better and, and what's funny is I'm the, the, the exact opposite end of that. I've been involved in electoral politics as a uh, leftist for 20 years. I was the only Democrat on my borough council for 15 years in a very right-wing area, uh, got elected on the basis of constituent service and speaking, you know, uh, truth to power. And um, I, I'm very frustrated and inspired by the people who woke up on Wednesday. So all of those, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. those folks who woke up on Wednesday, yeah. and I moved from, you know, you know, where the fuck were you on Monday? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's know, right. To, you know, I'm glad you're here right. and sharing the skills. So, what I found in, in New Jersey, uh, in my county, uh, was the uh, progressive wing of the Democratic Party uh, called Progressive 100 of Democrats. And um, we branded it PhD because, you know, we, we're going for the branding. But the interesting thing about being inspired by Bernie, I am at the age of 63. and. You know, being inspired by Bernie, I, I do stand-up comedy professionally, and I was working at a comedy club in Burlington, uh, Vermont, about 20 years ago when he was running for re-election for Congress. So I should have brought that button with me. Um, I um, met him on the streets of Burlington, where he was running, and my dad's name is Bernie, so I asked him for a cop, you know, if I could get a button, he said, oh, take it on. So he actually Aww. pinned it on it, which, I, which I wore, and it said Bernie 92. And I tried to, the funny thing is, I tried to give it to my dad, and he said, no, I don't, I'm not going to take that. I don't want people to think I'm 92, you know, which was ludicrous, which was ludicrous to me. But the, the point is, we did a comedy show benefit for Bernie back then. And he was always you know, there as a guy, you know, watching him from Congress to Senate, I always felt that he represented not me geographically, of course, but he represented my interest and values in the Senate. Uh, that is somebody who I would stay in touch with and gain contributions to over the years, because he spoke truth to power when no one else did uh, in, the, uh, you know, in the Senate. So. Oh, yeah. Well, and that speaks to something else that people have brought up, which is that for, from people who know him well and have known him for 30 years, like 
you know, people from Burlington and you know, a lot of people who have kind of followed his, um, his career, he has a fervent, like crazy level of trust. Right? So, so he has this base of supporters that would kind of do anything for him, right? Because he's so different from, from everybody else. Um, and we're gonna, so we're gonna have a few questions here at the beginning um, before we get into talking about what we're doing. And so my other next question for you is how can we create a thousand Bernie Sanders? Like how do we do that? Um, I mean, I'll tell you what we're doing. Um, we, um, <coughs> being in my county, there are 26 towns, and the local Democratic, the county Democratic Party, essentially um, has only filed in maybe a third of the towns. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we, um, again, with branding, I mean, very important for people to understand. We began a program called Get in the Game. And we've been emailing out to Democrats saying that, you know, if there's no local Democrat on your ballot, just write yourself in. And if there's even no way you can win, run on an issue. That's what we're talking about. Even if you can't win your community, find an issue that is important to you and an expert on that issue. So even if you're going to lose three to one or two to one, you become the person that is the expert on the education or the economy or whatever. So now we have at least we've got about 14 people that will be writing themselves in. They right. now become understand that they can't win in certain places, but they're just you know any from a 19 year old all the way up to an 82 year old yep. are writing themselves in. Are you getting so, any pushback from like um, other Democrats that are running saying like don't primary us? No, not at all. No, no it's been, <laughs> of course it's been not. a beautiful one. Uh, no, no, of course. That's all we've been getting is pushback. These folks are very much huh. Hillary bots, very corpo Democrats, very, you know, they've started to embrace uh, using the word progressives. We're all, the, the chair happens to be a Latina, and she, while she's against, for example, um, a prong in the agenda of the Democratic Party to uh, support sanctuary cities, she does play the fact that she's a woman and she's Latina very well to say, well, of course we're progressive. How could we not be progressive on what team and on one? How could but I be? How could I be part of this I'm female. I'm exactly. <laughs> I feel so, like if you have to say that, it sort of begs the question, right? Well, whatever it is, but, women for whoever, yeah, or yeah, this exactly. group for whoever. So, like, that makes you graduate. So, so we've been taking the steps to um, push the Democratic Party mm -hmm. in a direction by requiring them to have on their agenda a discussion of sanctuary cities, a discussion of five hundred fifteen, a discussion mm -hmm. of. of wage of protection, which is a big issue in our area, and for the Democratic Party to have this discussion. Even if we lose, at least we now show their truth of power, we show our truth of power, their truthfulness is, is that they're opposed to saying her cities. I mean, put it out there. Right. Let people decide. So that's what we that's what we okay. try to do. Great, so glad you were working on that. Awesome. But who else has ideas about how you create a thousand? How would create people who, with all the things that we just said, right? People who um, have campaign experience, they, um, they're they honest, they're consistent, they talk about issues. Like, how do we do that? Well, I think um, he's disrupting political culture. So I think there's maybe a normalized understanding of politicians being the way they are. I mean, so both Trump and and Bernie kind of ran on the populist platforms, right? And Hillary just couldn't pull off what either of them were doing, right? Um, so I, th I think, um, you know, even what he's doing in your little snippet video here, right? Um, oh, can I be a politician and do that? Can politicians speak like that? Because politicians usually, you know, everything's kind of vague. They don't answer questions. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I think he. Their hair is perfect, right? Well, I think in some ways he's giving permission yeah. to not be like the stereotypical right. politician. That's right. Yeah. It's yeah, which is good for all of us. Right? It's okay to tell somebody, I'm sorry, that's not the way it works. This is the way it works. We cannot give you everything, but this is what you can do. I mean, as a, as a labor guy, you know, I go through that all the time. Politicians want to tell you, yes, we're going to give you this, give you that, give you this. Yep. Bernie has, you know, 
Bernie is honest in saying, look, it's going to take a lot of work to get whatever it is done mm -hmm. to get to the single payer health care, to get right. you know, whatever it is, but it's worth it. Will you, you know, will you join me on the on the journey? So how do we get how do we get more of that kind of person though? I think that uh, part of it too is um, along with the movement, uh -huh. uh, the amount of information that is able to be disseminated now because of electronic media, because okay. of Twitter, because of, you know, Obama was the first one to really capitalize, um, but that is another way. The problem with me is I work 12 hours a day. Okay. How am I going to look and find someone? Okay. You know, uh, I live on Long Island, well, look, Someone you, don't, against Pete you don't have to. You don't have to be the one to do it. We're looking for ideas. Of how, no, like, I'm saying, how can we? But that's that's the thing. People people are working mm -hmm. are working a lot. Yeah. Thinking Twitter is amazing. Mm -hmm. Twitter is an amazing uh, collaborative tool. Is an amazing uh, communicative tool mm -hmm. and a, a way to hey you know anyone out there. Is anyone okay. out there willing to run in the second district, Long Island? Is anyone willing to run so and so? Is anyone? That's that's how things yeah. start. So getting more people to run, right? Yeah. Um, Facebook. And, um, well, no. Sadly, I think fear, anger, anger, uh, righteous and didn't, uh, you know, like his frustration about people who just woke up on Wednesday, right? Yeah. So I think you know there's going to be a backlash from Trump. The, you know, what Trump has created, the people waking up and whatever else and saying, oh, crap, you know, if Hillary would have won. I mean, you've probably all heard this before, right? Right. If Hillary we're not won, really talking about national politics. We're talking more about creating a thousand Bernie Sanders at the local level. Right. right. Still yeah. pissing so, people off and making well, yeah, them afraid right. of what's going on Getting locally. People, and, people who are outraged and fed up and, right. and, and at the point where they're, you know, like, what was it that caused you to be like, oh my god, I live in a country, I, I live in a country, I have to do something, something, it's right? Was it Trump? Right. Yes, <laughs> there you go. It was. To, for me, it was Bernie. Like, I was right. a software developer, and I did my thing, and that was what I did, and then the Bernie campaign came along, and I quit my job to volunteer full time. So, you know, it was this inspiration of what he, of the future to believe in, right? I, I believed in that future, and I was so inspired that that, you know, became this, my wake-up call. Well, to piggyback on what uh, what he said before too, Joey. Joey, thank you. Um, it's too early. Uh, one issue, one issue that really the one issue that just burned me to no end was Flint. Um, that Flint. burned me, and the fact that uh, Flint, Flint, Michigan, Michigan, and the fact that people are now being evicted from their homes, or they're pushing to evict people from their homes. That, but so right. beyond, it's like oh, so, what, yeah. yeah what, so, you're talking about disseminating information, educating the public, right. helping people to understand what's really going on. That's right. That is the first thing. Yeah. We're, mm -hmm. we're getting the balloon stacks on. I mean, you're, you're, yeah. oh, uh, we, we you're, can talk more later. You talk about that. <laughs> yeah. First, the information, then you talk about practical, you know, then you brainstorm about, okay, what can we do about what's burning you? Yeah. You you start the you know you start people uh -huh. getting excited and then you're like all right now what are we gonna do about it who do you know who do you know who do you know this who sounds you know? okay this is this, this is good because okay. this is like it's already a segue into what we're what we're doing let me I'm just gonna do one other question before we dive into a kind of explanation of, of what the incredible does we should um, hear from that side of the room and well. exactly and I'm <laughs> yeah. looking here from this side of the room because we hear a lot from this side of the room um, what could we do with no corporate money progressive majorities in a thousand cities. If we had a thousand cities in the US where the mayor and the city council was a supermajority of no corporate money progressives, what could we do? Well, one, one thing is to, to back local initiatives to uh, have public financing in terms of the shutdown. Uh -huh. government. In, the, in Maryland, Montgomery County, where I have been this is again just the local level, doesn't apply to state or federal candidates. What public financing elections? In public, if you opt into public financing, you can't take any path. Maybe it's unfortunate, but you can't take any real estate path other than. And the maximum contribution, there's a 
progressive candidate did a right by real life. The maximum contribution is $150. Right? If that gets max, you get $750 from the account. So I was, it's a great feeling to go up to my friend that's running and say, hey, I maxed out. I've never maxed out on a candidate. <laughs> we just passed it. I worked on the um, X1 in Berkeley, which yeah. was the Berkeley's public financing, and then our maximum is 50 bucks. Yeah, that's good. And, but it's, this is the first time, this is the first election that's uh, We've had this, and I'd like people to get to the point where they say, look, if you don't take public financing, I'm not going to back, I don't care what you do. It's going to politics, really, but if you decide you're going to raise mm -hmm. money from, you know, lots of rich people or corporations and stuff, you should opt, because when you take public financing, you're limited to so what you can't take any corporate money. So that, that, right. that can be accomplished at the local level. Not oh, easy, yeah. But uh, it, it, the federal level is almost impossible, but the local level, you know, you can do it. Absolutely. Other things we could do if we had it, if we had progressive majorities in five six. Well, you could have all, I mean, you'd have an increase of democracy and you can move toward a lot of, you can move to a more progressive tax system. You could, uh, Locally, more progressive taxes locally. Yeah. I'm going to offer something that's a, a radical idea. Um, in the city of Richmond, um, a, Richmond, California. Richmond, California, sorry, Richmond, California, um, a progressive, they, they actually couldn't pass it because they had, um, at, the, at that time, they had less than 50% of the state council. They were missing one vote. Mm -hmm. But when the housing crisis in 2008 happened, they proposed that the city use the threat of eminent domain to buy the mortgages of all of these underwater houses um, at market value, current market value, um, and then loan them back, refinance the mortgages, the mortgages, and loan them back to the owners of the houses um, at reasonable rates, market value, reasonable market value rates that those people could buy. Um, so if we had, and, and part of the reason that didn't pass is because um, Wall Street spent millions of dollars campaigning in Richmond to make sure that it didn't pass. In this little, in this little city. Yeah. Richmond's 110,000 people. Yeah. I, I didn't think that's that's it. it would be repeated. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but imagine if, if it wasn't just Richmond. Right? And so this, this story of Richmond, we're going to get it very deeply into the story of Richmond because um, it's, it's amazing. And, Part of why they couldn't do it, and part of why it was so important to the financial industry to squash this before it happened in even a single city, is because if that happened in one city, then other cities are going to start doing it too. Mm -hmm. And if that happened in a thousand cities that were all communicating to, with each other, we could have averted the housing crisis. I mean, that's a little bit mind blowing to think of how ways that we can protect our citizens, protect the residents of cities from the horribleness that is our national politics right now. I mean, we're all focused on national. We're all focused on like, oh, we have to, you know, turn the Senate and the House blue and we have to X, Y, Z, you know. And, and it forces us back into this lesser two evils. Like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Just any blue, it doesn't matter. Maybe they're corporate back, maybe they're whatever, but like, you've got to vote for them because if we don't, it's going to be a Republican. But if we had a thousand cities that had progressive supermajorities, we could protect people from a lot of what's happening on the national level. And this is just one example. This is kind of the most radical, crazy example. But like, you know, healthcare, like there's a lot of stuff that we could do um, in terms of healthcare. There's a lot of stuff that we could do in terms of, um, I don't know, in, in, in the, the environment, protecting the environment. There's a ton of things that cities can do to protect um, our residents from what's happening at the national level. The what just happened a couple of days ago with Paris Accords that, you know, once individual cities start taking it upon themselves to, to take action and become informed and know what to do and do it, then Trump is basically defeated on that point anyway. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, you know, the local, the local uprising, <coughs> not the Right. Yeah, once you really start thinking about what can happen when you control city governments, um, it becomes very powerful. Number one, you can protect people from national policies. Number two, um, you can get people to vote in midterms. 
right? You have a slate of people that they want to go forward for their city, they're going to get out the door and they're going to vote. And then, of course, they'll vote on the national ticket as well. Like, that's the biggest problem, that's the biggest hurdle for midterm elections. Right. People just don't walk out the door, right? They don't go to that polling place. We have a bunch of local elections where they really care what's happening, they are going to go and they're going to vote in the national elections too. Um, like what did Reverend Schuyler tell us about the Democratic primary for mayor of New York City? Uh, Only 3% of the voting electorate voted in the Democratic primary. Voted for him. Voted, voted for, for him. him. Right. So maybe there was another 2%. Maybe, but like, maybe like 5% of people who voted in the primary, which is, which is insane. So you no. have this tiny minority that gets to pick who's running for mayor in New York City. In New York City. So if you get people excited and engaged about their local politics, they're going to come out and vote for the local politics, which means they're going to it's just there anyway. They're going to, you know, they're going to vote up the ticket as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Richmond Progressive Alliance. So Richmond saved 110,000 people. Um, for 100 years, it's been totally dominated, and all the politics is totally dominated by Chevron. There's a big refinery there. Um, Complete corporate control. They, they literally, Chevron had a desk inside the city office, right? They had to have their desk because, you know, they paid all the politicians to be there and so they could talk to them every day. In reality, um, the city office should have had their desk at Chevron. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. exactly. You know, to be a little more honest, the city office should have, yeah. been, should have been at Chevron. Yeah. Um, and uh, it has a very checkered history. Um, it is not a rich place. Uh, you know, a lot of sort of exploitation of African Americans that they brought from, specifically brought from the South to work in, a, you know, a variety of places yeah. and then wouldn't allow to buy houses there and or then even, like, or even have or houses or like even live in certain areas. That like, isn't right. allowed if you, you know, in the yeah. 30s or 40s if you were African American. Right. Um, and, you know, by the time the turn of the century came around, um, had the second highest crime, homicide rate in the country. Um, very high crime rates, poverty, homelessness. I mean, this was a troubled, troubled city. And in 2003, a bunch of people got together. They called themselves the Richmond Progressive Alliance. Um, they formed coalitions with all of the you know other groups that were doing service in the area, um, and they're working on issues. And their goal was to take over local city politics. Um, and they got one per first election. They got one person in city council. Their second election. Um, they got two more people on city council, and, and the city councilor got elected as a mayor. She served eight years as mayor, and she turned out. She was the one who suggested this eminent domain and worked on this eminent domain policy to protect homeowners from the housing crisis, uh, along with lots of other, you know, really, really interesting, super progressive, amazing policies. They now have the mayor and a supermajority, five out of seven city council members in Richmond. Um, and so what we're doing is we are, um, here, who here has heard of Indivisible? Okay, so some people maybe haven't heard of Indivisible, yeah, have you heard of Indivisible? I'm sorry, yeah. what's Indivisible? The, the group called Indivisible? No, I haven't heard of it. So Indivisible, um, you want to tell me? Yes, what? I do, and I have a story about that. Good. Uh, Indivisible in Westchester County. Well, there are actually two major, two major parts of Indivisible. Can There's you just one say what it is first before you talk about that one? I don't know exactly who started, in, oh, Indivisible, but it, it, they put out a document uh, similar to what uh, build themselves as the, uh, the leftist alternative to the Tea Party, what the Tea Party did. And they put out uh, a 25-page document about what the situation is how the Tea Party people got where they were, how they were able to influence politicians. And shortly after that... It was uh, a guide on how to create... Yeah, it's a guide. It was a guide, which is still available for download, by the way. It was written by some former Capitol Hill aides. Yeah, Capitol Hill aides. Yeah. Yeah. I used to work on Hill myself, but I remember hearing about that. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, right, right. And within a month, they had 6,000 chapters. Yeah. My particular chapter went crazy. We have two major chapters in Westchester County alone. There's one called Indivisible NYC 16, which is uh, some of it's, it's mostly the 16th congressional district, but a lot of it covers what we call the river towns in Westchester County. Uh, Tarrytown, Dobbs Ferry, uh, Yonkers, that part. 
and then it was indivisible Westchester, which I joined up, which is primarily the central to South Shore towns. Uh, within three days after they announced their presence on Facebook, some 400 people had signed up. Wow. After six days, it was over a thousand. Yeah. About a week or so after, they called a kickoff meeting in Larchmont over at uh, over at a local church. They were anticipating maybe some 250 to 300. They got over 700 people, and I know I was and I know I was there. It was so big that they had to move it from one uh, from the basement part of the church up to the main floor, and then um, they split up into subgroups. New Rochelle uh, is indivisible Westchester. New Rochelle alone has eight subgroups. And I'm with a subgroup that is primarily interested in working on uh, the local level politics, particularly uh, county legislator. We're working to see if we can get not only a new Democratic county executive, but a supermajority of Democrats for the county legislator. Yeah, so, so this was basically they put out a PDF, and they were well-connected people. Um, and it went crazy. It went crazy. And, and, the, and that story that you told about, like, you know, they had, well, in Berkeley, they had 37 people, and then they had 400 people, and then they had 1,600 people, you know, and the next, it was, like, insane. Um, and, you know, they're, I think, I don't know whether it's 6,000 or 9, I think they're now, like, 9,000 different indivisible groups around the country. Um, very active, like, it's, it kind of was this crazy thing that happened, yeah. So, so I guess I pose this as a question is where the Democratic Party has been around for a hundred years. Um, I've seen many of groups like the Indivisible Group come and go yep. based on the issues of the day. So the question is, as organizers, how do we sustain that mm -hmm. to make sure that they're yes. here in a year, right. five years, and ten years when Donald Trump is no longer the yep. organizer? Effect? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, we are, we are not... You know, we, we mention Indivisible simply because, um, like, we've been inspired by Indivisible. Um, and we are also going to put out a, a guide, right? So, so we're going to put out a guide um, that uh, helps people form their own incorruptibles chapters in their own city. So what the local chapters will do is they will run, so it's, it's a group, it's a team of people. And this is what Richmond Progressive Alliance talks about, is they say you should not Sorry, I missed the beginning of this session, but <clears throat> how is Incorruptibles related to Indivisible? It's not. Okay, sorry. Completely unrelated. I, I only mentioned Indivisible because if you haven't heard of Indivisible, you might not realize that, like, if you put out a guide on how to do this, you know, there's some chance that maybe 6,000, you know, groups will form around the country, and we don't expect 6,000 groups to form around the country, but, um, you know, if we had 100 different cities sign on to us within the first couple of months, that would be wildly successful. Right. Um, so and that's with, totally within the realm of possibility. Yeah, so if you, right, exactly. So if you look at Indivisible and how that spread because they put out a guide for this is how you do this, and you look at the Richmond Progressive Alliance, which in some ways is our template, we're like, what, what if we could do this all over the country? Yeah. People can do this all over the country. So that, that's where we're coming from. That's where we're coming from. So yeah. here's the concept. Um, the local incredible chapters, and this the Richmond Progressive Alliance talks about this a lot. They say when you run lone candidate, well, sorry, lone uh, ranger, lone rangers, lone ranger candidates, um, all of their experience dies at the end of the campaign. Either they get elected, and then they're just trying to run their own next campaign, like that's all they do. They can't, they don't have the resources to help the next person, or they don't get elected, and then that experience dies there as well. So they say you need to have an organization that will continue to learn, where a failure of a candidate is a benefit to the to the group because now they've learned about how to run the next campaign. And you know what? Cities are different. Just because I know how to run a campaign in Berkeley doesn't mean I know how to run a campaign in you know Richmond, Alabama. <laughs> um, so that's vitally important information that needs to remain in that city. So they will run candidates. They pool campaign resources. We'll talk about that a little later. They create coalitions. We'll talk about that too. Um, they, of course, canvas and phone bank. They gain experience and name recognition for the group with each election that will remain in that city. And they support their elected officials afterwards with research and actions. 
And I wanted to, sorry, I want to just jump in yeah. and give a quick example again. Uh, we spoke to Reverend Schuyler, who um, is, is part of uh, Fort U, uh, Unitarian Universal Church, and he's also part of Faith New York that is uh, an alliance of a bunch of uh, faith groups that are, are working on progressive uh, values in our government. And one of the things that he told me, that he just volunteered to me in our first conversation was that he's actually from Wisconsin, and at the time that, um, you know, Wisconsin was turning more conservative, and you know Scott Walker was in office, and, and that whole thing—you remember everything that, that happened with him—and it's still going on with him. Um, so the Reverend was thinking to himself, "I really want to run for office." And then he thought, "Well, I have no idea what what to do, who to contact, like how to start." And so these are the kinds of things that are going to help people—you know, really good people, smart people that have progressive ideas that want to put them into practice plug into a network, plug into a group of people, is what Anna's about to talk about, that can really support them and help them on their way and, you know, so they, so they have a network, you know? So they, anyway, continue. Yeah. <laughs> um, so those are what the local chapters do. Um, the national chapter provides campaign training. Um, it connects the local organizations with the national network. Um, we'll also have a network of sitting mayors and city councilors who can talk to each other about policies that they're doing in their cities that hopefully they can, you know, if they're fighting a fight against, you know, Wall Street here or against, you know, Chevron refinery there or whatever, like they can work together um, on those to put more pressure. Um, we can take care of the legal stuff. We'll have a federal PAC. Uh, so obviously if you're in a criminal's chapter, then you don't need to worry about that. Um, we provide the open source technology. Um, and, and we are playing the long game. So when these politicians, and this is what Virgin Progressive Alliance is doing now, the people who have been in city council and mayor, they are now running for state, state political levels. So, and in our talks with state, polit state level politicians, um, what they say is that moving up to the state level is completely different from being totally in different. politics. It is a shock, and that you need to be prepared um, because a lot of people, that's where the corruption starts happening, is because you come into this environment where suddenly it's a wash, everybody else is bought out, and you, you can't, you don't even know how to get things done as a progressive. Um, and this is in California, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, so we're going to provide that training to people at the local level and how to move up to the state level and how to, you know, sort of get things done at that. But isn't, um... <coughs> I mean, if we look at green energy, California's on the cutting edge, right, of the United States. So how do we reconcile, right. sorry? Right. No, I, I just, right, and even in California, it's hard. We, uh, we were talking with uh, a city supervisor who moved up to the assembly, so he's a city supervisor for San Francisco, and now he represents the eastern half of San Francisco, which is where I live. Now that he's in Sacramento, his colleagues are all bought by tobacco and oil and pharma and things like that. And um, it's, really, it's really, really difficult to... Uh, but let me it. finish. Yes, please. How do, how do you reconcile a green, such a green, relatively speaking, state with everyone being bought out? Right. Uh, well, well <laughs> I mean, we're the most, maybe we're the most green state, yeah. but how green does that make us? Right. It could be greener, right? Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. It, what it means is that the level of corruption in our country is just off the charts right now. Um, you know, <coughs> he's having trouble, and and it's also possible that environment is one of the the less common. Um, you know, the the fossil fuel industry is doesn't have as much power um, in California as they have in other states. Um, you know, and we're hopefully going to pass you know some healthcare in California too. So there's you know the health insurance industry and these other things, but but it is not easy. You know, we're blue, 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 blue state. And half the Democratic um, people in, who are in state government in California are hard to convince on universal health care. I'm, I'm not very good about blue state in, in Maryland, but the Democrats have a super majority, yeah. similar to uh, California, but trying to pass things even like the minimum wage increase. It's like so many Democrats, because yes. it's, it's effectively a one-party state, you now yeah. have the Democratic Party shifting to the corporate one portion of it, the large enough portion of it, so that you can't often get down a group, particularly on economic level. And on social things, it's a little different than on yeah. anything with the dollars involved. Right. It, it, but California, you guys can tell me, I know the um, healthcare, uh, kind of the uh, 
state uh, health care initiatives in California were less. When Schwarzenegger was governor, the Democrats passed a health care bill, right? That was a very progressive bill because they knew it was going to be vetoed. That's right. So they, it was easy to vote for. Talk right. about this. That right. makes me a good liberal. Exactly. Now that there's a Democratic governor who has some reservations about this as well, it's much, it, it, when the rubber meets the road, the corporate Democrats are like, wait a second, it's not as easy. That's, that's exactly, exactly right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Provided a great example yeah. of your question, John. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to next walk you through is um, our guide, we, we hope and have it done um, by next weekend, we're going to People's Summit. Um, it's already have a draft of it done, but this, this sort of 10 points is taken mostly from um, the Progressive Alliance and what they talk about as how they form theirs and what they really believe in. <coughs> in addition to also, you know, sort of our last six months of research into how people have gotten into elected to local politics with no money and no corporate money um, and all that. So um, the first point is that um, Big money is the enemy, corporations are the enemy, and while money isn't the only corrupting influence, it's a really good place to draw a bright line, right? It, you gotta draw a line. So the, the original Progressive Alliance, the one thing that they, they will not endorse anyone who takes any corporate money. You take one bag of corporate money, and it doesn't matter what policies you have. You just have to draw that line. Um, and so we are also drawing that line. So no corporate money. Um, unions, yes. Police unions, sometimes questionable, right? Um, why? Depends, why? but why? why? Um, yeah, in local politics, police unions are often, um, they, they get the majority of the city's money, um, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a financial circle that happens. Um, so if the police union can give enough money to the right politicians, the politicians give more money to the, to the um, police. And unfortunately, the way that police spend money is by militarizing. Um, and in a lot of cities, the, the police brutality is a big problem. And so police unions have unfortunately been very protective of um, the culture of police brutality. And so that's why police unions are, are sort of this um, asterisk in the list of unions. So in general, it's like, we, yes, we think unions are good. But unions do not count as corporations to us. Um, but they have, I mean, unions classically are incredibly corrupt, which is, oh, I'm told, majorly reason for their downfall in the United States. So we're talking, mm -hmm. why are they less corrupt than anybody else? Because the ones that are corrupt are probably not going to give us money. Okay. okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is, this is, and this is in part in our conversation with the Russian First Alliance, is they were like, you know, it turns out that the unions that are really corrupt, they, they actually don't want to give us money. They're not interested in us. Um, and so we were like, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, as we grow and as our network gets larger and as all this experience running local campaigns grows, this, we might modify this, you know? But this is where we're beginning. Um, and, you know, just to reiterate, if you get one back of corporate money, then your, if any of your candidates take any corporate money, you are not a member of the Incorruptibles. That's just the way it runs. Um, we are party agnostic. Um, third parties have difficulty winning. Major parties um, are both corrupted by corporate money, especially at the top, maybe not the local levels. Um, but it, it's, you know, it, the way that we see it, and there are, there are a lot of people who have a lot of opinions on this, um, but basically, we believe that it is important to not um, get involved in parties because there are many states where if you are one party, you cannot win. So if we, if we decided to join one party, and let's say it's the Democrats, because obviously we're all here to left form, um, then there are entire you know, counties, cities, states where we simply couldn't run any candidates at all. Um, that is just not the culture. And there may be people who absolutely want all of the things that we want. They want universal health care. They want a minimum wage. They want you know all these <coughs> things. But they have, they're culturally red. Um, so, and this is also a thing that the, the Richard Progressive Alliance talks about, is they say, um, 
they say beware of party operatives trying to subsume the group. And so they, in their experience, they had people from the Democratic Party who would come in and try to get them to take corporate money, try and loosen those lines, try and get them to enter the, corporate, to the Democratic Party, um, where then they would no longer have independence, they would not be able to make their own rules. Um, and they felt that that was something that would water down what they were doing and basically sort of kill their movement. Um, so we feel very strongly about being party agnostic. Um, we consider ourselves post-partisan. So these are the only two rules that we have for groups that join us and call themselves the incorruptibles is that if they, as a group, join a specific party, then they're probably not going to be a member of the incorruptibles. Um, and if, they, if their candidates take even one dime of corporate money, then they should probably be somewhere else. They, they, they belong to some other group. Um, <coughs> Now, run by organizing and organize by running. I ripped this off from the virtual progressive slides because I love it so much. Um, don't be a lone ranger. No one can gain from your election or your failure. You have no support. Um, so you want as a means to educate your community, to develop anti-corporate consciousness, and to create a long-term progressive local organization that will remain in place long after the election is over. <coughs> uh, Former core team. Uh, people who are committed to the mission and agree with the first two points. Um, go over the, the sort of culture dots that we have, draft your bylaws, we have templates for those, um, hold general meetings to form issue teams. Yeah? Can you just go back to the mm -hmm. last, uh, just for a second? I'd yeah. like to, um, uh, if, if you could just go, one is a means to educate. This yes. is something that's very important, and yeah. there's a consciousness always that, well, if I can't win, I shouldn't run. And mm -hmm. one of the things that Brody talks about is exactly this. I think this element is extraordinarily important to yes. educate people on and inspire people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a whole, we're working with Les Leopold. And I'll get to this in a second. But um, Les Leopold is a, he runs the Labor Institute and um, wrote a book called Runaway Equality. Uh, and he goes around giving these 90-minute workshops on, you know, how our entire economy has been taken over um, and uh, that every corporation has been converted into a means by which the, the rich can extract money. Um, uh, and it's really powerful and actually we have, you know, Liz can present, you know, a bunch of it as much as we have time for um, at the end. Um, and that's part of our education is like, if people are interested, then we're more than happy to like help them to understand this sort of broad um, battle that we're all facing. Um, but also what you're talking about, which is that people should, in, in this kind of scenario, and also in a ranked choice voting scenario, people can run simply to learn, to learn how a campaign works. Um, and here, what's important is that that knowledge then remains in the group and people learn um, and, and it's crucially important, and, and very much like what you are doing, is getting people to go ahead and run and surviving that pushback um, from people who, in a non right choice voting system, don't want you to. It's, it's sort of interesting to, and, and I didn't realize this is even occurring. I mean, the current um, Democratic Party structure has been sending people to the indivisible meetings, to the action together meetings, to. Um, you know, to sort of say, hey, let's all do this together. Yeah. Um, they are looking, the indivisible groups are looking to collaborate but not be taken over. And the Democratic yeah. Party has been pushing very hard to ha have them be taken over. Yeah. So an interesting uh, notion. So. Yep, and I think that actually doesn't, like, for indivisible, it kind of does make sense. Like, it makes more sense for indivisible than it does for us. Um, like, indivisible is a counter, like, that's their entire purpose is to counter Trump's agenda. That's why indivisible exists. And my worry, again, I think about the indivisible groups is, was what you mentioned before, hey, like, let's say Trump is impeached or he just gets voted out. Like, will indivisible completely dissolve? Like, there are deeper problems than Trump. Um, and we, we can't just stop when, when we don't have Trump anymore. We have to, you know, there's a much deeper fight that needs to be fought. Um. My question, I think I kind of asked it before, going back to 
your example of the housing or with my example on Long Island with Hurricane Sandy yeah. being categorized as a superstorm and people not being able to capitalize on their insurance, um, there are issues that come up that people need to be educated about. Is yep. there a place for the group to also do ed issue education? Yes. So let me get to that. Um, <laughs> yes, there is. Yes, yes, yes. So form a core team. I think we went through that. Like, um, you form issue teams, campaign teams, um, and start looking for candidates. Um, they also recommend having a minimum dues. It can be very, very low. But like, just having a little something that people have to, you know, kind of put their skin in the game. Um, and say yes, I'm actually, you know, really believe in this. I'm going to put in my like. They're, for them, it's like twelve dollars a year, the minimum membership. But they they also say like, we expect you to be, put in more than the minimum. <laughs> Please put in more than the minimum. That is just a minimum for you know very low income people. Um, okay, coalition building. <coughs> so, um, you create a list of unions, NGOs, and service organizations, churches, community organizations, and opinion makers who make progressive statements and blogs, I was the editor at the City Council of Board Meetings. Um, so we go as, as local groups, go into the community um, and make connections with these natural affiliates first, kind of get them on board with what we're doing, um, attend their meetings, meet with their leadership to let them know um, about you know, our mission and how, how what we're going to do is provide them with leadership that's inside of them. Um, and now we're going to do sort of the education part. There's two parts of it. Um, one is something we call continuous town halls. Continuous town halls are basically what Bernie has been doing for 30 years. And what he does is he chooses a very specific group of people. So he'll choose a mining town, or he'll choose a senior citizen center, or he'll choose a college. Or he'll, you know, he, he's like, I want to know about this demographic of people. Um, and not the, not the wealthy, right? <laughs> so he's choosing people that he wants to learn about. He goes there, he asks them questions for an hour, two hours, and he hears from lots of different people on different issues, right? Um, and he'll say back to them, okay, so I'm going to summarize what I heard from these 10 different people. It sounds like you guys are saying X, Y, and Z. Um, then he educates them on those issues, on what's happening. Come on <coughs> so, for individual issues, he educates them on what's, why those issues are not being resolved. Um, and that's where we can speak truth to power and we can say, hey, in our city government, here's why this issue isn't being resolved. Because this company is paying off these people and, you know, this is the way that it really works right now. Um, and he can also be, as you said, realistic. Like, it may be difficult to make this happen. Um, but we need your support because we are the people who are going to fight for you. Um, so it's very important to, to understand the issues that are happening within your community. And, um, and what the British Professor Alliance talked about is they say identify the hottest issues in your city. Um, put out white papers, make these central to central your campaign. And these issues are the ones that are important to voters. They may not be the ones that are important to your core team. But it's important that if they're important to your voters, that you make these central to your campaign and you follow through on those on those promises. Um, and the other part is education. Um, we have, we are, like I said, we're working with Leslie Apool that we have a specific sort of educational component. So after you've reached out to people and, and listened to them, at the end you say, hey, by the way, we have this, you know, this workshop on runaway inequality and how corporations are controlling our government. Um, are you interested? Um, and after they've listened, after you've listened to them, heard all of their concerns, they're much more likely to sort of want to, to listen to you. Um, and so, again, um, Liz, at the end, after we go through these, is going to go through some portion of Les's workshop, which is pretty fun. Um, Les is actually training 30,000 people. Um, he's already got 1,000 people signed up, and he's going around the country to get more people signed up. Um, he's starting an educational movement to form, you know, like, he's trying to sort of recreate the populist movement of the late 1800s, where these kind of like, educators have to tell people about what was going on. Um, but we're, we're working with him to create our curriculum for this. Um, and then, obviously, you got to get candidates. If you want to find candidates, don't commit to not taking any money from corporations. Um, commitment to the cause is a lot more important than how they look, how they sound, what their experience is. 
um, you want people who are really going to fight for, and they're going to be honest, um, and, and they're, they're going to fight for what we're doing. Um, we, our candidate training is based off of um, Wellstone Action. We're working with Wellstone um, from Minnesota. They're like the top. They've been doing for 17 years. It's, it's the two sons of Paul and Sheila Wellstone who started this organization. And they have the absolute best candidate training in the country for progressives. Um, so we're training with them to train. They actually have an entire division of their organization that is there to help groups like us. Um, we're also working with Democracy for America um, because they also have candidate training. So we're going to work on taking those training, um, training programs that they have and scaling them to thousands and thousands of people, thousands of groups. Um, and then the candidates need to be the people running these continuous town halls. They need to be going out to, to the constituents, listening to them, giving them the, the brutal truth about why these issues aren't, you know, being, uh, being solved now, and then asking them, mobilizing them, saying, you need to, you know, give what you can and get involved in the Incorruptibles, our Incorruptibles chapter here in the city. Half day, this is question I asked Jay. Uh, Justice Democrats the same thing, they couldn't answer it, that's why I dropped it. Um, what happens, let's say you run a candidate and there are allegations that they took corporate money and you yeah. find out they actually did. Yeah. What happens, you drop them, but do you reassess and say, okay, you know, what happened? Were there signs? You know, how, how do you? What's so, the process? yeah, for us, um, and it's a, a very good question, and I will also say that we, um, we, we are constantly learning and growing. So we would love your input on this as much as right. anything. Um, for us, it's a little bit of a different question because we aren't selecting the candidates. Right. We are building grassroots teams. Okay. And so our question would be, hey, what happened in this grassroots team? Like, how did that happen? Um, and, you know, we're not going to vet teams that just want to call themselves the Incorruptibles, or probably, you know, I mean, somebody wants to call themselves the Incorruptibles, whatever. But we provide a lot of resources. And for any group that wants our resources, they're going to go through a vetting process. The group, the core team members are going to go through a vetting process. And so we're developing grassroots teams that are going to continue and that are going to find candidates and that are going to do all these things. So, so for us, it's not a question of the candidate and our selection process of the candidate. It's a question about what is happening in this grassroots community team and should they continue to receive our resources and be able to call themselves an incorruptible grassroots team. It's how, let's say, I'm, I'm a team member. I find, find out that a candidate's taking taking money. I'm like, hey, we need to drop this guy. Right. We made a mistake. You know, as and, opposed and, you know, to that can happen, yeah. right? It, it's you could have a great grassroots team. They could take somebody on board. It could turn out that that person just lied. I mean, you know, right. not impossible. Well, do you trust? Or it could turn out that that person five years later changes their mind and they're like, oh, now I need corporate money because I'm running for the state level. Right. Well, then the grassroots team probably again, this is still a failure of the grassroots team. They did not properly prepare that candidate. And so we want to prepare candidates. Another thing that we've thought about a lot is having our own kind of special sauce in candidate training, which is the corruption part. Um, like, how do you navigate the halls of power without giving up your progressive values? And that's a very important question. So what brought me into the room was yeah. the title of the session, mm -hmm. Incorruptible Creating a Thousand Burns. Yeah. So how does the incorruptibles differ from Invisible or the DFA or any of the other groups that are essentially doing the same thing. And aren't you merely recreating that which has been done already successfully elsewhere, like after Howard Dean's campaign, DFA was formed, and you know, I mean, certainly our revolution does uh, much of what Bernie uh, talked about. So, how does, how do does the incorruptibles differ or make better or make it more accessible? Yeah. So I'm going to address each one separately. So the indivisible is doesn't do any of the things that we do. I think indivisible is entirely different. They don't run candidates. They don't. I mean, indivisible in the guide they specifically say, do not have an agenda. 
The only thing you can do as an indivisible person, the only thing we recommend you do is you know, meet with your existing representatives to tell them, to either thank them or tell them how unhappy you are and make their lives difficult. So, so Indivisible doesn't run candidates, they don't have campaign training, they don't have, none of those things. So I don't think that Indivisible has any similarity to us at all, except that we intend to put out a guide, and they put out a guide that's basically the only, the only similarity that there is with Indivisible. Um, in terms of DFA, I'm a member, I'm a state leader with DFA, so I know them very well. I also run an our revolution group, so you're actually choosing groups that I know intimately. What is DFA? I don't know. Democracy for America. It was begun after Howard Dean's campaign. They have now split with Howard Dean um, ever since Howard Dean supported Hillary and DFA supported Bernie. Um, DFA is um, very attached to the Democratic Party. Um, so they are not party agnostic. Um, they also are not, uh, they don't have any rules about corporate money. Um, DFA is, uh, it is also, it's a group that they have a board, they have staff, and then they have grassroots people. Um, our entire organization is going to be run very differently. Our national team, um, while we we will have staff, because you simply you can't have a, a long-lasting organization without any staff members, um, our uh, national team is going to be um, mostly run by and the strategy decided by volunteers. The people who want to join, um, like the, the, um, we read a book called No Shortcuts by Jane McAlevey. I highly recommend it. She's um, amazing, a lifelong union organizer, and has been involved in some of the biggest union wins this century in the last 20 years. Um, and she talks about how the left has lost its ability to organize, and then instead, what we're doing is we have these organizations that have like highly paid staff members that make all the decisions, and then the rank and file is removed from strategic decisions, from, from really doing anything except for sort of, you know, rote, repeatable tasks that are doled out. And it doesn't matter which person it is, right? They want to make sure that, you know, it's just numbers. They just, just get, you know, get a thousand people to make this phone call, read the script. It doesn't matter who that person is. Um, we fundamentally believe, we call it radical creative diversity. Um, it's this concept that every volunteer has their own um, set of skills and perspectives, and that we need all of those if we're going to start a movement. So we invite people to, uh, to enter, um, you know, to join us and be on our social media team, be on our um, events team, be on our speakers team, we're going to go out and speak in front of the public and uh, the media to be on our tech team, to be on our core team, to be on our strategy team. Um, so we're, we're internally a, a very different organization, I think, from the ones that exist today. And I love DFA. They do excellent work. Um, and I, but they are also aren't building grassroots teams to take over cities, right? They have grassroots DFA groups, and it's like, you know, I'll watch this movie about um, uh, that's about a particular issue, and you know they they like I, I I get it and I and I understand because I'm involved with them and they and they have campaign training and, and all that is great, but I think what they're doing is not a holistic approach to um, radically taking over local governments with a unified. They also don't connect cities. They don't connect any of the elected officials, they don't connect the cities, they don't, you know, so there's a, a lot of ways which are different. And our revolution is its own story, but again, our revolution at the moment appears to be an endorsement. Well, no, I, I, I mean, having been involved in our revolution, our revolution seems to be very much um, the creative way DFA was when how it being dropped out, you know, eight or 12 years ago, that it was created from the personality of Bernie Sanders which is great getting a lot of people involved. And again, the question is, will it be around five or ten years you know, from now to continue doing that? Which actually leads me to my next question. I'm sorry, I don't want to comment, though. Yeah, I feel like right. Jean had yeah, a question before you. Can we, can we? And, no, no, and I, also, I also, like, we're so close. There's only three more slides. And I wonder if we can finish those slides. Sure. And then, because these are questions, these are broad questions, right? Write down our questions, questions the and we can finish it. Yeah, if that's all right. Sure. Um, yeah, there's only three more slides. Let me just do those. Um, 
So in each local uh, incorruptibles team, there, there should be at least one person who can serve in the role of the campaign. So, and you can share this. So you can have a, a campaign manager. You might have more than one campaign manager if you have more than one candidate. But you can share having a treasurer who can work for all of the candidates. You can have an outreach coordinator who works for all of the candidates. Um, a fundraising coordinator, a database person, a traditional media person, a social media website, a newsletter. Um, these are skills that you can maintain within the group and use for every election for multiple candidates. Um, and February 1st, campaign season starts. So um, for local elections, starting February 1st is actually very early. Um, most people don't. But if, if we get the jump and we start February 1st, we start knocking on doors, um, then you just have all that more time to get your word in, in front of voters <coughs> before the corporations start pouring their millions of dollars in um, and try to convince people otherwise. Um, so this means in addition to education and continuous town halls, which should be done year-round, election year or not. Um, campaigning means canvassing and phone making. Um, and then the group continues to support the coalition in non-campaign season. So the group continues to go to these other progressive organizations' um, events. They're, you know, they may have an action that they do. Um, continue to support those. Um, the group also supports the elected officials with research and actions. Um, so once they get people into office, then the local group can make sure that they are, if there's you know, a demonstration that they can do outside, they're working inside and outside of government to make things happen. Um, they can also do a lot of research on legwork for any proposals that those um, elected officials are trying to get through. Um, and that, thank you very much, <laughs> is, is, is the end of this part of the presentation. We have some of Les's talk. If that's what people want to hear, Liz can present a lot of Les's talk, which is kind of this runaway <coughs> inequality educational component. Well, um, I feel like, though, I think. But maybe questions. People, yeah, I feel like people have questions, and I, in listening to our own talk, would kind of rather listen yeah. than talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would rather listen to what you guys talk. want. So. Um, but I would also like to propose that maybe we, we break into two groups because I feel like we haven't heard from this side of the room as much. So maybe well, I can. Small, I mean, it's a small group. And yeah. Maybe the questions would be, well, you guys tell us. We yeah, just tell us. Two, or we're happy to. Well, any of the quiet people, I'm happy to hear them speak up. And if they don't. <laughs> that's why too great exactly. We don't want to force anybody. Well, so if you don't have any questions, that's fine. But, but now it's time. So, so I have two yeah. questions. Like, what would be the next step? Let's say I'm ready to quit my job and, you know, just a hypothetical. And that's one question. And the other question was, it sounds, so you, you mentioned postpartum or something like that, which is a wonderful term, right, Where, wherever that's going. Uh, so Bernie went Democrat, right? Well, I mean, he was independent for 30 years. Right. right. Years. But then he decided to. For the presidency. Right. So maybe you could discuss a little bit about how, because it sounds like it's not irreconcilable to be a Democrat and be an incorruptible. Oh, of course not. Right. And we expect many, I mean, perhaps the vast Because you said too, you could be a Republican and be an incorruptible. I mean, you say, almost sounded like the local, although it might be a stretch, but. Uh, you know, we, we just had a bunch of people join our national team from Omaha. Um, and, you know, it's a very right place. Um, I mean, the city less, obviously, than the, than the rural areas, but um, there are a lot of good people, and they've been knocking on doors. They've been doing this sort of knock every door. They did the knock every door thing before knock every door, the organization existed. They've just been knocking on doors and talking to people. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people who want the same, they want Bernie platform, but they call themselves Republican. I mean, in Bernie's own state of Vermont, he got 25% of the Republican voters, 50% of the Democratic voters, and 70% of the independent voters. And independent voters now, according to Gallup polls, consist of 50% of the voting population. 50%. The Democrats were 29% before the election. They are now down to 25%. And the Republicans were 25% before and are 25%. Can I clarify your stats? 50% yeah. of the voting population, that means people who can vote, not necessarily do they vote. Is that what you mean? Um, I believe that is correct. Oh, okay. I believe that Which that is correct. But, but also the vast majority of people who vote only vote for the presidency. 
and in the presidency, yeah. right, the general election, you do not have to have party affiliation. Depending There's no what state, reason. Depending what state. Are there any states where you have to be have a party affiliation to vote in the general election? I don't. Okay. I'm not no, no. 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 I'm, I'm, yeah, okay, I'm confused on that. Would you ever back a candidate that you have that your group hasn't personally vetted, but you know, like if Tina Turner was running or whoever, you know, if she's running for governor or uh, Sam Ronan runs, and you know that candidate, uh, would you support them? Not necessarily, you know, actively stump them. Well, so so, and this goes to the question of: Are we repeating what other groups are doing? So. It's a very common question, will you endorse X? You know, an endorsement to me seems like it takes five seconds to do, and what good is it really? Yeah. Like, I'm sure people will, like if we become a successful organization, people will probably want our endorsement, but I just don't see the point, frankly. Like what we're doing, we are not, an endorsement group, and our revolution is an endorsement group. DFA is an endorsement group. You know, a lot, and, and they may do other things in addition. But this concept that some group of strategists at the top, who are I'm sure pay a lot of money, make some decision, yay or nay, about whether this person is acceptable or unacceptable, that's that's not our aim. We support grassroots organizations. And those grassroots organizations are going to choose their candidates. And as we grow, and as those candidates grow, they're going to move up to the state level. But they will already have been Incorruptibles members. So the candidates that we support in the grassroots teams in the local level, these teams are not going to like wander around looking for a candidate. Oh, you're a candidate? Oh, great. OK, check. We endorse you. That's not how it works. From within their ranks, Right? They get people who are going to work closely with them, who are going to come to their meetings, who are going to have part in the policy dis direction of the group, because the group itself is going to come up with policies. Right? And those candidates need to be aligned with those policies. So the candidates are going to be part of the organization um, in a very real way. They're going to grow with the organization. They're going to be tied to that organization. Their support is going to come from that organization. Their experience, and if they don't win a campaign, which is very common, that experience, they're going to stay with that organization because that experience, they can learn from the, the next camp, from the next person who maybe does win. In Richmond, they ran these two people for city council, and the one they thought was going to win didn't win. And then Gail McLaughlin, who was just this, you know, Green Party, um, 60 some odd year old granny, she won the city, city council. And two years later, she was the mayor. <laughs> Bravo! And she, and she was freaking amazing. And she tur sadly, she turned out. Term limits, another thing we can talk about later. Okay. So my second question was, yeah. was, what was the next step? What's the next yeah. step if I want to get involved? That's right. So at the moment, um, we are uh, inviting people to join our national team. And we have a lot of different teams. And the way that uh, people join is we have uh, two phone calls. So we start off with an introductory phone call. A lot of them you know, be repetitive because you're here. Um, but we also we ask you about yourself, uh, your background, why you're interested. Um, and then the second phone call is um, with two members of the team you want to join. So it'll be the team lead plus another member of that team. Um, we also have a, a reading list, so we kind of expect people to have either watched these, you know, the videos or read. You skimmed a little bit of uh, some stuff because we, we have an, a culture that's very important. Um, and it's like Jay Mayer's Dark Money and Runway Quality, Marilyn Leopold, and the book that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, North Shore book, No Shark. No Shore Those, are, those are the more sort of, yeah. you know, intellectual things. Yeah. But, but we have some culture things, like Google did re some research on the perfect team and found that um, it is not how many experts you have that makes a great team. Like the most successful teams are teams that have um, psychological safety, where people feel like they're not going to get attacked for saying what they honestly think, um, and where experts and non-experts spoke approximately equally. 
Um, so these kinds of things, like that, we we really want people to understand what we're going for. I mean, there's another book, there's a TED talk as well about service leadership, um, which is very important to us internally as well as with our uh, elected officials. So. Um, we have a reading list, and we hope that people take that week between the first phone call and the second phone call to at least skim over some of this. And we have some very broad, broad questions that we have about that, just to kind of get your, your just get you talking you know, um, about culture um, and about values. Um, and then once you join, we have an open source tool that's similar to Slack. It's like a group chat tool, um, but we don't want our data to be um, available to big corporations. So with open source. Um, communications tool, we have an open source campaign database um, that we'll make available to the, the local teams as well. Um, so that will be right now, uh, that's what we're doing. We're going to grow out the national team a little bit. Um, and, and by next weekend, we're, we're making connections. <coughs> we're we're going to um, provide a draft of our um, PDF to people at the People's Convention, sort of Bernie Tokyo. But that how to start your own incredible. Sorry, the people's senior attack. That's right, the guide of how to start your own grassroots yeah. and corruptibles team. Yeah. And then we will get feedback and we'll kind of have a network of people who are uh, likely to spread that. Um, and then within the next couple of months, we'll be starting the grassroots teams. So it kind of depends whether you want to be involved in the grassroots team or whether you want to be involved in the national team. And they're very different kinds of work, I think. I'm sure that this question comes up. Uh, I'm in a unique yet not so unique situation. Bernie lived in his town forever. I came up, I grew up in Virginia, I moved to Chicago, then I moved to Long Island. I'm an outsider, you know, and Long Island is insider. Insider, like, to the nth degree. I have no idea how to crack that. Um, and I know that a lot of the attacks on the progressive movement is these guys in Virginia are getting all these all this money and influence from the outside, from outside sources. That guy isn't even from Long Island. He's from Virginia. He's from here, there, the other. Thing. Any uh, suggestions on how to crack that? Uh, I, I only all I can say, and I'm no expert. Um, yeah. Is that Bernie had not lived in in Vermont that long before he first ran for Senate? Okay. Right? He ran for Senate, I think, in '70. Oh, that's right. But he'd only lived there a couple what years. What am I talking about? He's from Brooklyn. Right, he's from Brooklyn. Yeah. The guy's a thick Brooklyn accent. Like right, he's from the South. And Vermonters are generations of Vermonters, right? Vermonters have been there for hundreds of years. So Vermonters did not see him as an insider. Um, and I think what people like about Bernie is that he's, all the things we said, he's honest, he's got integrity, he's consistent, he's actually listening, he's listening to what people want. You know, most of the people he goes to a town hall, they have never had a politician, ever, of any level, come to listen to them, ever. Right, and you I actually out of think, these towns and, yeah. and he actually and I, doesn't run out of the room, too. I, I think that might be the key. I, I understand what you're talking about. I've lived in a lot of different and I think sometimes the perception is exactly as you say. You know, people could, oh, well, who do you think you are telling us what to do? It's like, well, how about if we if we invite? If we say, hey, I'm really interested in your experience, and I'm really interested in, in making your life better, you know, your everyday life better in your neighborhood, in your specific locality. Why don't you come to this place at this time, you know, 6.30, maybe we'll have donuts, and you can let us know just what your experience is and, and, and start and just start listening. Right. Instead of making it about you, hey, yeah. I've lived in this town for 10 years, blah, blah, blah. Right. That's don't, right. Yeah. I don't know what you have to bring. I yeah. That's the idea of a lone ranger candidate. I'm this, I'm that. Right. The grassroots organization is about building power locally by listening to people. And, and you know, the idea of like, come here, we'll have donuts, and we'll listen or to you. Or the even more radical step is, don't come to me, I'm coming to you. Oh, right. right, right. So like, that's, and that's another thing, like, we have a very progressive mayor in Berkeley, and he has office hours, and you gotta go to him. And you know what? Most people don't have time, and they're not gonna go. 
or they don't feel like they have the, the privilege, right? right? So go to them. Go to something they're already doing, right? And that's why these coalitions, building these coalitions is so important. Something they're already doing. Yeah, I like so it. So on the issue of corruption, I'm sorry because I missed the beginning and yeah. we have addressed the middle. <laughs> New York State has a company more people who can be picked in corruption that they teach out. Ran on that issue a lot of your book I've read, which is quite good. Yep, yes. Um, I was friends. at the trial of Dean Skelos and Shelly Silver. Silver I've had dealings with up in Albany and a lot of them. They have tenant issues. To me, it's a very important issue, but you know, it doesn't really seem to galvanize. I don't know what so besides the corporate money issue, what do you have on the agenda in terms of what sort of litmus test? How do you determine in advance who might go the wrong way? I mean, how do you structure? Right. Okay, I love this question. So thank you. Um, because for many months when we started this organization, we were a money and politics group. And we were going to train candidates on how not to become corrupted, right? Um, not exactly what all candidates want to do, right? <laughs> not a lot of takers. In, in, in the end, we realized, like, huh, probably not going to have the kind of people who want what we're offering. Um, so what we realized in our discussions with Les Leopold is that we cannot be single-issue groups anymore. Right now, we must be a movement. And the movement, which is already gone, like it's a train, right? As you were saying, um, Bernie, it's a sign of the times, right? Bernie, yeah. the ship has already sailed. This ship has sailed, right? Occupy Wall Street, Bernie Sanders campaign, like this ship has sailed. Like everybody already is on board with right. universal so health care, with the immigrants. That that's right. That's every, the we're all the same thing with green. It's the we're same thing with green energy. energy, but we're not organized. That's politically. exactly. Right. But we're not organized politically, and so. What we decided was that we need to be a group that um, starts grassroots teams of people, grassroots teams of people, um, getting local candidates elected in their own cities with a few simple rules. And one of those rules is you cannot take one dime of corporate money. If you do, you are out. Zero corporate money. And. You know, we're not going to put this in the guide, but one of our big goals is to pass um, money and politics reforms at the local level. Pass public financing campaigns at the local level, pass ranked choice voting at the local level, um, pass lobbyist reforms at the local level. Um, get all this stuff cleaned up so that, so that now we can really run, so that the, we're not going to fight so hard. But the question, like, there's another question which we struggled with a lot, and which we hope to be a good answer for, which is a lot of good people get into politics, and 10 years later, they're not progressive anymore. We could probably all name somebody that we know of, that we really believed in, and 10 years later, what happened? So a lot of what we want to do is to prepare people for what they are going to enter. Um, because there are some, some classic pitfalls. Um, and, and you know, if we understand the classic pitfalls, if you understand them before you go in, um, then you can be prepared. Uh, inoculated. Inoculated, you can be inoculated, that's right. So, so it's, it's actually not as important at the local level as it is at the state level. Like, like we've been talking to the state, some state level politicians in California, and what they said, and they came from a ranked choice voting, public financing campaign city, where everybody is passing common sense laws, right? Um, and then they moved to the state level, and they were shocked by the, the ugly, the corruption, but the ugly punishment that the, they, the tax, the they tax got. they yeah. got for trying to pass com pretty common sense stuff. Um, like job killers and economy and anti-business and just you know getting tired with the brush because they want to raise the minimum wage or because they want to advocate for retail workers or that's right. So preparing people who are at the local level and what they're gonna be up against once they get to the state level. Um, and also uh, you know money really is a big deal, money in politics. So when you make that no not one dime of corporate money, that's a pretty important 
thing. And if you can keep these people supported with, with a team around them, that is kind of the way they got into politics, right? Um, that I think it'll help in terms of them becoming corrupt. There, there's lots, I mean, I could talk about this particular topic for a very okay. long time. We're actually like 10 minutes over time. No, I think we go until 11.50. 11.50? Oh, until 11.50? Oh, shoot, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I go ahead. You're totally good. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, let's see, what else okay. can I say about corruption? Um, <laughs> you know, money is not the only thing that corrupts, right? Power corrupts. Um, and not just power, like, honestly, the people that you affiliate with. Like, you just naturally, if you talk to a certain type of people every single day, then, of course, you're going to see their side and you're going to, you know, and this is what happens you know, they say that in Congress, um, con members of Congress spend, on average, four hours a day in the phone booth raising money. And what does that mean? They're calling rich people. They're hearing about the concerns of rich people. And how many hours a day are they talking to individual poor people? <laughs> I'm getting emails almost weekly from Elizabeth Warren and uh, you know, Virginia. All these senators what's, what's your conversation with her? What do you tell her about your life? Nothing. What do you tell her about she your life? She wants concerns? five bucks. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. And, and you say you're getting those weekly? I wish I could get them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, getting, they're getting a lot more confrontational in the emails we're going Yeah, yeah. Like, I, 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 I lose everything get, if you don't send five dollars. Oh, I, and I've got like, you know, one congressional candidate from out of state from Congress said, you know, who are you not to give me five dollars? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought, well, that's a radical. Well, you know what? They were, they're were they all looking at Bernie Sanders, right. and they're how like, they're how do you do it? Right. we got to do it, too. Right. We're going to squeeze you guys for five bucks. And all, the you know? yeah. and all they know is fear-mongering, right? That's what they know. Yeah. So they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it by honestly asking you, what do you need from me? Well, I went to a talk last year on the politics of resentment, mm. and it was just blew me away. So it's finding where the frustrations are, where the resentments are, and, and fluff them up and build on them, right? I mean, it's, yeah. even I mentioned fear and whatever else, or, or Trump getting me pissed off enough to say. The right wing's done that for years. very successful. And not one wanted, and I mean, not one wanted the whole country to be forever, you know? It's like, uh... Well, you have to direct that fear, I mean, you have to show them a path. I mean, undirected fear is, What's getting us into the mess in the first right. place? So <coughs> that's you know that's what you're talking. I want to say it wasn't just not one because I grew up in the '50s. It was the red scare. There was always a scare. There was always a corporate scare they were imposing on us yeah. to feed the military machine. That's you know, I mean, right. we have to really take all our issues into the. We work so hard to get the peace, the word peace, into the climate march. You know, I mean that's. We're in our silos. We have to That's see it as we're in our stall. And and the talk from like you know we don't have time for it now, but like the Les Leopold talk, I have to say is totally amazing. He really he basically goes from you know he, he gives all sorts of statistics and numbers and everything and talks about how um, the people who own the corporations have changed the incentive for CEOs. Right? So it used to be, I'm going to give you guys a punchline, okay? Yeah. It used to be, but this is like an hour long talk and it's incredible and you should absolutely see the whole talk. Um, it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Leslie Leopold, and it's a, it's a fantastic talk. Leslie Leopold, Runaway Inequality. Um, so essentially, change the, the, the um, incentives for CEOs so that while CEOs used to be in 1989, just to be paid 5% of their payment was in stock incentives, now it's 83% of their pays and stock incentives. So what are they incentivized to do? Drive up the price of stock. And how do you do that? You cut wages, you, you know, reduce benefits, you um, do all of these, you know, you squeeze your workers, and then you, um, you do corporate buybacks, which used to be illegal. And corporate buybacks is where you buy back stock. You buy your own stock. You buy your own stock. Right, your so, right, so there's you less of it in circulation, right. and that way your stock price goes up, and that way you make more money because it equates to 83% of your salary. It's a total scam. 
Yeah. And then they use, then they go into debt. They let give the corporation's money to go into debt and buy back the stock. And then the corporation has debt, which is tax deductible. Right. Yeah, they write it off. That's right, they write it off. And then the, the cities and, and states no longer have any money because they don't get the corporate revenue from corporate taxes because the corporations are all in debt, buying back their own stock to increase the stock price and extract all of this wealth. <laughs> well, and then at the end of Liz's talk, and, and, you know, it's like an incredibly powerful talk. At the end of his talk, he's like, we can no longer, and he, he has this great part where he says, like, you know, the, and all of our environmental problems are driven by this, and all of our, you know, social problems are driven by this, and all, you know, like every, he goes through every issue, and he tells, he says these incredibly compelling reasons why, like Eric Garner was picked up off the streets because the city that he was living in was um, starved for funds. And so they were picking up anybody they could, right, to squeeze, like he's selling cigarettes on the street and they're not getting taxes from him. So they're gonna scoop him up, right, with the police. And so, you know, even these black lives, even these issues, social issues, mm -hmm. um, and the prison sure. population has skyrocketed as inequality has gone up. Um, that all these issues are bound together and we must get out of our silos and we must be movement builders. And that is, in fact, what convinced us to not be a money politics group and to be, like, we have to be, with the entire movement, we have to be to join together with all these other well, just, just briefly on the stock buyback, and frankly, uh, when they have these tax holidays on overseas funds and they say, let's bring them all home, to try to do that again now, take care of that. A lot of times they did that, they, they said, oh, we're going to create jobs. Studies show that a huge amount of that money that was sent back to the United States went directly to the corporate uh, stop by that. Sure. Absolutely. That's jobs. the first thing they're going to do. But then when they when they try to sell it, they say, we need this money to invest in America. Oh, yeah. That's not what they do. 75% of corporate revenues, I think, goes to stop by that. Goes to stop It's not going to your paycheck. It's not going to R&D. It's not going to pay your paycheck. It's like, it's insane. And the other thing that Alyssa says about it, you know, the metaphor he uses with the car, when you buy the car, when you, when you take out a loan for a car, who pays back the loan? You or the car? Well, when you, uh, you do. <laughs> but when you, when, you, company, when you buy a company, the company pays, pays back, back the loan, loan, not you. Ah. Uh, which is good. Uh, <laughs> which, that's all left. We got that from him. Yeah, he yeah. came to San Francisco last week and, um, and spoke at our launch event. Well, Berkeley and San Francisco, uh, which was really amazing to have him there. And, he, and he's here. He's in New York. Yeah. Part of the Labor Institute. Um, so, yeah. So you had your hand up and then. Well, you know, this is like incredible information, but how are we getting it out? I mean, that's. You know, we have this, uh, well, have this particular thing of, of I know you missed a lot of the talk. I know, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so in short, we are building grassroots teams around the country that will be trained, be able to um, train their candidates uh, to take over city politics. And one of the things that we offer to people is this educational component will give people the whole like slide deck and some training and how to do it. It's a very interactive Q&A style um, presentation so that they can go into their communities and teach people about this, about this runaway inequality that's going on. So we have an educational component as part of what we do because we believe that, and Les has found, Les goes to, to you know, wildly read you know, cities and districts and talks to 100% Trump voters, right? And he finds that after they hear this talk, they're like, we want universal health care, we want them in $15 minimum wage, you know, they're, they're converts. So, it's very important to have an educational component. We have one that we that we you know provide for any grassroots team that wants to do it, um, and it's based on Leslie Abel's work. Yeah. So there, I'm on it too. You can see who I am. Um, and, and as much as you mentioned this, uh, I, I'm from Massachusetts uh, now, and uh, we had this fellow f at Occupy Boston uh, who uh, ran as No Money Mike. We all made jokes about him, and you know what? It's really hard to run a campaign with no money. So he did not take any donations, and he did not get a lot of votes. But he got some. And this past year, he accepted money and, uh, from us. And so uh, No Money Mike is one of the Bernie Kratz that Bernie actually mentioned in the um, uh, 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 Our Revolution. He had mentioned uh, Mike. So Mike success, it was successful. He is our state senator for yeah, uh, Mike Conley. Yes, Mike Conley. Yeah, yeah. He was okay. he presented at the Our Revolution. Election. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah so, 
So um, um, anyway, um, and of course, he only had the support of you know, whoever knew him, like me, or um, a bunch of people from Akihabaya, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so what? I don't know. Um, uh, there it is. He didn't run a campaign where his, he didn't talk about Bernie's values too, uh, the actual values too much, but he talked about his own, and he was, well, he was successful, I guess, is uh, the main point. Um, and he didn't have any type of support like this behind him. And as you probably know, the Re Democratic Party charges you to use their database. The Republican Party does not. And as I, I personally am actually a registered Republican because I get to go to Republican meetings and talk to people who don't necessarily agree with me, which I think is my uh, role in life at the moment. I can pass, put on a suit and tie, I'm great. <laughs> and I did go to a candidate training with the GOP and it was all about you know, doing things uh, properly and doing funding, did not talk about Democrats whatsoever except to mention that we Republicans have a harder time because we have to have jobs. What? Republicans have to have jobs. No, I've done the same thing. I go to uh, break see. that down. I'm yeah. sorry, just a clarifying question. I don't yes. know. I don't get that. Republicans have to have jobs. Right. Well, well, Democrats, you guys don't need jobs. Is the implication? It's a sarcastic. It's, sar it's, it's a sarcastic very funny observation that. Republicans make, well, of course the Democrats are out in the street. They're all unemployed. That's the... Oh. Yep. Okay. It was um, funny at the time. Poverty-loving liberals, that kind of, you know... And we have about five minutes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you. three minutes, so... Oh, no, I was saying I do the same thing. That I, I go down to CPAC each year, and I walk amongst the very conservative right wing because I'm, you know, fat, bald, bearded, and gray, and they think I'm one of them so I can pass, and it's very interesting speaking with people you don't necessarily agree with. It's a very strong way to learn. And in my opinion, extremely important. Very important. We've got to talk to people who don't agree with us. Right. Ah. Oh, and by the way, I will just uh, jump in for one second to say, if anyone is interested in joining uh, the national team, you can go to the incorruptibles slash join. Or you can Actually, just, just go to the incorruptibles. Yeah, and if you want, you're, you're welcome to just kind of... Um, we also are going to have a newsletter, and so if you, okay. if you're interested well, in newsletter. Well, I tried, it seemed like it was uh, cap sensitive to it. I, I tried typing in, you know, all small, and it, it didn't, it didn't uh, go the, the, or uh, originally. When I went on, on the site yesterday, I had to type all caps. I don't know why. Um, let's talk about that later. Yeah. Yeah, let me know afterwards. Yeah. I just want to say, I mean, it's great that we talk to Republicans. But I can't even talk to Democrats anymore. Right. Yeah. You know, my family thinks I'm some kind of nut job. <laughs> my daughter, my grand, you know, they all voted for Hillary. And uh, so we have a lot of uh, education to do. I mean, yeah. people are very fully informed because of the lamestream media, you know. I mean, yeah, the lamestream media. I don't know how we work this yeah, in. You know, but it, we have yeah. to get the men, we have to get like baby talk back sheets out for yeah. the not just the right wing, just our own wing is nowhere. Well, you, you know, need to start talking here. about the people, though. Right. Talking about the issues for, for the second you mentioned Bernie, people like, ah, oh, or the second you mentioned Hillary, or what, whoever it is, whether you're for them, against them, whatever, right. that's not the point. The it point isn't. is the issues. Whew. Awesome. Well, I think that's, it. that's Thank probably you. it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, we're the incorruptibles at US. Sorry, we're the incorruptibles.us. I need more coffee. I got my little um, <laughs> yeah. in the a rehab at the, oh my God, at CPAC. <laughs> that, that might be a faster way to sign up on our website.